So let's take a look at the fundamental theorem for line integrals. So let's say you have a vector field f, and it is going to be equal to some function p times i plus another function q times j. So in order to find out whether or not a vector field is conservative, all you have to do is take the partial derivative of p with respect to y and set that equal to the partial derivative of q with respect to x. And if they are equal to each other, then we know it is conservative. Now another way you can think about it is if you write this in component form, you can rewrite it as p comma q. So p is going to be the x component, q is going to be the y component. So if you take the partial derivative of the x component with respect to y, and that is equal to the y component with respect to x, then you know the vector field f is conservative. So for these first set of problems, let's go ahead and determine whether or not f is a conservative vector field, and if it is, find a function f such that the vector field is equal to the gradient vector. So for number one, we have f of x, y equals x times e to the y times i plus y times e to the x times j. So notice that x times e to the y will be p, and then y times e to the x will be q. So once again, in order to figure out whether or not this is a conservative vector field, all we have to do is take the partial derivative of p, or the function p, with respect to y, and then set it equal to the partial derivative of q with respect to x. So let's go ahead and first find partial derivative of p with respect to y. So y is going to be the variable x is a constant, so the partial derivative will just be x times e to the y. And then for the partial derivative of q with respect to x, x is going to be the variable y is a constant, so we get y times e to the x. Notice these two are not equal to each other. So that tells us that this vector field, or the specific vector field, is going to not going to be conservative. So now for number two, we have f of x, y equals y times e to the x plus sine of y times i plus e to the x plus x cosine y times j. So once again, y times e to the x plus sine of y is going to be p, and then e to the x plus x cosine y is going to be our q. So once again, we're going to set the partial derivative of p with respect to y, and that's going to equal partial derivative of q with respect to x. So first, let's go ahead and find the partial derivative of p with respect to y. So that is just going to be equal to e to the x plus derivative of sine y is cosine y. And then for partial derivative of q with respect to x, we're going to have e to the x plus cosine y. Since these are both equal to each other, we can say that it is conservative. So now we need to move on to the next step of finding a function f such that the gradient vector is equal to the vector field. So since the vector field f is equal to the gradient vector, we can say that since the vector field is equal to this entire thing, this entire thing is also equal to the gradient vector of f. Now remember the formula for the gradient vector is equal to f sub x times i plus f sub y times j if the gradient vector only consists of two variables x and y. So because we use this formula we can say that y times e to the x, so this entire thing or p, is going to be equal to f sub x, or the partial derivative of the function with respect to x. And we can say that f sub y, or the partial derivative of the function with respect to y, is going to be our q function, or e to the x plus x times cosine y. So what we need to do now is we need to take what we have for our partial derivatives and then work backwards to get the function f. So for f sub x, notice we had to derive the function with respect to x, or partially derive it with respect to x, to get to here. So we have to integrate that with respect to x to get back to the original function f. So that's the very first step. We're going to integrate f sub x. So if we go ahead and integrate y times e to the x plus sine of y with respect to x, we're going to get y times e to the x and then plus x times sine of y. Now whenever we integrate we do need a constant of integration like a plus c or something but in this case we don't have a plus c, in this case we have a plus another function but this time in terms of y, so g of y. And the reason why that is is because when we partially derive this with respect to x obviously this will cancel because it's in terms of y it's just going to be zero and we'll get right back to here. So just remember every time you integrate f sub x you have to add g of y. So if I move this over a little bit, since we integrated f sub x, we can now call this f. And so now the next step is to partially derive this with respect to the other variable. So now we're going to partially derive with respect to y. So f sub y in this case, we're going to take this, partially derive it with respect to y. So we'll get e to the x plus, we get x times the derivative of sine of y, which is going to be cosine y. 
and then plus the derivative of g of y is just g prime of y. Since f sub y is equal to this entire thing, and if we look up here, f sub y is also equal to e to the x plus x cosine y, I can go ahead and set these equal to each other. So I'm going to remove f sub y and set it equal to e to the x plus x cosine y. So now I can go ahead and solve. Realize that e to the x's will cancel, x cosine y's will also cancel. So we're left with g prime of y is going to equal 0. And so now the next step is to integrate g prime of y. So if we integrate g prime, we just get g of y. And the integral of 0, if we integrate with respect to y, is going to be 0y plus. And now there's normally a plus c, but in the proper notation for the constant is just going to be plus k. So now 0 times y will just cancel. And so we're left with g of y equals k. So now I can go back to the original function that we had. So f is going to be equal to y times e to the x plus sine of y, or plus x times sine of y. If I add the x here, times sine of y, and then plus g of y, which we have found to be just equal to the constant k. So this is going to be the final answer. So now moving on to the actual fundamental theorem for line integrals. Let's say you have the integral along the path c of the dot product of the gradient vector of f and dr. Now given that r of t, a vector function, ranges from the t bounds of a to b, we can say that the fundamental theorem is going to be equal to f of r of b minus f of r of a. So realize that there are similarities between this and the fundamental theorem of calculus also, where the integral of f prime of x dx is going to be equal from a to b is going to be equal to f of b minus f of a. So this is the formula we're going to use for the next set of problems. So for these next set of problems, for part A, let's go ahead and find a function f such that the vector field is equal to the gradient vector, similar to what we did in the previous set of problems. And then for part B, we have to use f to evaluate the integral along the path c, the dot product of the vector field in dr along the given curve c. So this is where we're going to use the fundamental theorem for line integrals. So for number one, we have f of xy equals x cubed times y to the fourth times i plus x to the fourth times y cubed times j. And then along the given curve c, r of t equals the square root of t times i plus 1 plus t cubed times j, and the t bounds are from 0 to 1. So we don't need to figure out whether these vector fields are conservative anymore. These are all going to be conservative. We just need to find a function f. So let's go ahead and start by finding a function f. So once again, the gradient vector f is going to be equal to f sub x times i plus f sub y times j. So in this case, this is going to be the f sub x, x cubed times y to the fourth. And then f sub y is going to be equal to x to the fourth times y cubed. Now once again, the very first step to find f is to integrate f sub x with respect to x. So we're going to take this, we're going to integrate x cubed times y to the fourth with respect to x. So if we go ahead and integrate with respect to x, we will get x to the fourth over four times y to the fourth. So if I rewrite it, we get f equals one over four x to the fourth times y to the fourth, and then we have to add the constant of integration. This time, remember, it's gonna be g of y. Every time we integrate with respect to x, that very first step, we're gonna to have to add the g of y as a constant. Now the next step, once again, is to derive the function with respect to y. So f sub y this time is going to be equal to 1 over 4 x to the 4th. Now the derivative of y to the 4th will be 4y cubed. And then we have plus derivative of g of y is g prime of y. So notice the 1 over 4 and the 4 will cancel. And so we're left with f sub y equals x to the 4th y cubed. And then plus g prime of y. Now the next step, once again, f sub y is equal to x to the fourth y cubed. f sub y is also equal to this. So we can go ahead and set those equal to each other. So x to the fourth y cubed equals x to the fourth y cubed plus g prime of y. Those will cancel, and so we get g prime of y equals zero. And so what we can do now is go ahead and integrate g prime. So the integral of g prime is just g of y. So if we integrate with respect to y, integral of 0 is 0. And then we have plus the constant, which is just k. So then we just have g of y equals k. So I can go back to the function that we have. And so we can say f equals 1 over 4 x to the 4th 
y to the fourth plus g of y, which is equal to k. So that is going to be the function. So now for part b, we need to use f to evaluate the integral along c of the dot product of the vector field f and dr along the given curve c. Now in part a, it already tells us that the vector field f is equal to the gradient vector of the function. So we can make that substitution. So we can say the integral of the gradient vector of f, or the integral of the dot product of the gradient vector and dr along the path c. Now once again, this is the formula, as mentioned earlier, of the fundamental theorem for line integrals. So once again, this is going to be equal to f of r of b minus f of r of a. So we can say that our bounds go from 0 to 1. So 0 will be our a bound, and 1 will be the b bound. So since we already have our function f, all we need to find here is r of b and r of a. So r of b is going to be r of 1, and then r of a will be r of 0. So now in order to find r of 1, all we have to do is plug in 1 for t into the vector function. So if I plug in 1 for t, we'll get the square root of 1, which is 1 times i, and then plus 1 plus 1 cubed, which is 2 times j. So if I write it in component form, we basically get 1 comma 2. Now we can go ahead and convert this to coordinates and just write it as 1 comma 2 in, in coordinate pairs. So we can say that r of 1 equals 1 comma 2. So now for r of 0, we're just going to plug in 0 for t into the vector function here. So we get square root of 0, which is 0 times i, and then plus 1 plus 0 cubed is just 1 times j. So in component form, we have it as 0 comma 1. And so I'll go ahead and write that in coordinate pairs. And so basically r of 0 is going to be 0, 1. Now if we need to find f of r of b minus f of r of a, well r of b is going to be r of 1, which is 1, 2. So we need to find f of 1, 2 minus f of r of a. r of a is r of 0, which is 0, 1. So we need to find f of 1 of 2 minus f of 0 and 1. So I can just go ahead and plug in 1 and 2 for x and y into the original equation f. So we'll get 1 over 4 times 1 to the 4th, which is 1, times y to the 4th, so 2 to the 4th is 16, and then we have plus k. Now the good thing about the fundamental theorem of line integrals is that it doesn't matter what the k value is. So we can basically set the k value equal to 0 and cancel that out. So we basically get 1 over 4 times 1 times 16, so 16 over 4, which will give us 4. So f of 1, 2 equals 4, minus, now f of 0, 1, so if I plug in 0 for x and 1 for y, we'll get 1 over 4 times 0 times 1, so that will just give us 0. So then 4 minus 0 is obviously 4, so that is going to be the answer when we evaluate using the fundamental theorem for line integrals. So now for number 2, we have f of x, y, z equals y times z times i, plus x times z times j, plus x, y plus 2z times k. So realize we have three variables this time, x, y, and z. So we have three different components, the x component, the y component, and the z component as well. So now in order to find a function f, the process is going to be the exact same as the previous problem. We just need to add an extra step since we do have the z variable. So we're going to do the same step here, find f sub x, f sub y. Since we have a z variable, we need to label f sub z as well. So f sub x is going to be y times z because that's with the i unit vector f sub y is x times z, because that's with the j unit vector, and then f sub z is going to be x times y plus 2z, because that's with the k unit vector. Now the first step is always we integrate f sub x with respect to x. So if we take the integral, we'll just get x times y times z, and then plus we have to add the g of y. So I'm going to go ahead and move this over a little bit and say that is equal to the function f. So now next step we need to find f sub y. So same process here, we're just going to derive with respect to y. So we have x times z plus g prime of y. Now this is equal to f sub y and so is x times z. So we can also say that x times z equals x times z plus g prime of y. Those will cancel and so we get g prime of y equals 0. Now if I go ahead and integrate g prime of y, we get g of y with respect to y is going to be 0 times y which is 0 plus now this time we don't add the k yet since we do have another variable z we're going to add another function in terms of z so this time we just say h of z so now same process here we're going to go back to the original function and rewrite it 
so that f equals x, y, z plus g of y, which we have found to be 0 plus h of z, so just h of z. So now, because we have the third variable z, now we're going to partially derive the function with respect to z. So f sub z is going to be equal to x times y plus h prime of z. Now we're going to set x, y plus 2z, because that's equal to f sub z, equal to x times y plus h prime of z. So x times y plus 2z equals x times y plus h prime of z. Notice that x times y will cancel, and so we're left with h prime of z equals 2 times z. So now we can go ahead and integrate h prime. So we get h of z equals the integral of 2z, which is z squared. And now we can add the constant of integration, so plus k, since we're done with all three variables. So now when I go back to the original function, we have f equals x times y times z plus h of z, which is equal to z squared plus k. So that is going to be the function f. So now we need to go ahead and evaluate this line integral using the fundamental theorem for line integrals. So first we need to find r of t, because unlike the previous problem, we don't have a vector function r of t this time. We only have c as the line segment that connects both of these points. But from the previous video, we know how to use two points to come up with a vector function r of t. So once again, the formula r of t is going to be equal to 1 minus t times r naught, which is going to be the initial point, plus t times r sub 1 the terminal or the end point. So in this case, r of t is going to be equal to 1 minus t times the initial point is 1, 0, negative 2. So if I write that in component form, plus t times r sub 1, the ending point is 4, 6, 3 in component form. So now we can go ahead and distribute over the 1 minus t to the vector. So we'll get 1 minus t, comma 0, comma, negative 2 times 1 minus t is going to be 2t minus 2 and then plus if I distribute the t to the other vector here we just get 4t comma 6t comma 3t so now if I go ahead and add those two vectors together we get 1 minus t plus 4t we add the similar components so we get 1 plus 3t comma we get 0 plus 6t so just going to be 6t and then comma finally 2t minus 2 plus 3t, which is going to be 5t minus 2. So that is going to be equal to r of t. Now since we use that formula, remember the t bounds, whenever we use the formula, are always going to range from 0 to 1. So 0 is going to be the a bound, and 1 is going to be the b bound. Once again, the fundamental theorem for line integrals states that we can take f of r of b minus f of r of a. So in this case, we're going to take f of r of b is 1, so f of r of 1 minus f of r of 0. So let's go ahead and first find r of 1. So r of 1, we're going to plug in 1 into the vector function here. We'll get 1 plus 3, which is 4, comma, 6 times 1 is 6, comma, 5 times 1 is 5, minus 2 is 3. And then if I plug in r of 0, so 0 for t, we'll get 1 plus 0, it, or, one times, or 1 plus 3 times 0, which is 1, comma, 6 times 0 is 0, comma, 5 times 0 is 0, minus 2 is negative 2. So if I write it back in coordinate form here, I'm going to write it as 4, comma, 6, comma, 3, and then r of 0, I can rewrite as 1, comma, 0, comma, negative 2. So basically, we need to find, using this formula, f of r of 1, so r of 1 is 4, 6, 3, minus f of r of 0, r of 0 is 1 comma 0 comma negative 2. So now f of 4, 6, 3, if I rewrite that down here, equals, we're going to plug in 4 for x, 6 for y, and 3 for z. We will get 4 times 6 times 3, and then plus z squared, so 3 squared is 9. Once again, we can make the k value 0, so that's going to be out. So then 4 times 6, 24, times 3 is going to be 72. 72 plus 9 is 81. And then now f of 1, comma, 0, comma, negative 2. If we plug in 1 for x, 0 for y, and negative 2 for z, we'll get 0 plus z squared, so negative 2 squared will be 4. So we get 4. So we can go ahead and take 81 minus 4, and the final answer is going to be 77.